Welcome to the third day of our school. This morning we have um, the second lecture from Professor Curiel, which uh, will talk about the causal structure and the delicacy of holographic arguments for unitarity. As usual, you can use the chat during the lecture only for clarifying questions. Obviously, for longer questions, we have the Q&A. And uh, another information, uh, tomorrow at uh, 5.30 in the common room on Gator, uh, there will be the gong show. Anyone who wants to speak there uh, can uh, sign up uh, using the Google form that, that Marco is, uh, I think, uh, posting in the chat uh, now. Uh, that's it, uh, Professor Curiel, uh, you can uh, start, uh, please. Okay. Um... Huh. That's not right. Not sure. Oh, I see. I see what's going on. Um, I'm I'm getting my act together. So have have no fear, or maybe have a little fear. Okay. Can y'all now see the slide that says a primer on black hole thermodynamics and the Hawking effect? Oh. Excellent. So we will pick up. Uh, no, right here. Okay. So a few prefatory remarks before I begin the lecture. Um, one, um, it's my birthday today. And it's actually, I know it's gauche to ask for a present, but I'm going to, but no one ever accused me of being gauche free, I guess. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask everyone here to give me a present, which is that y'all should be really excited and ask me lots of questions and and you know get really fired up because this is really really cool fun material and in honor of my birthday actually i stayed up until i stayed up until about 6 a.m well last night this morning uh like rewriting everything because i had i had this great idea for a better way to present it so i hope it works and also to, to all you students out there if you if you ever thought that becoming a professor meant you would never do all-nighters again yeah, uh, think again, that, that, that doesn't work, it still happens. Okay, cool. So, a little, little punchy from lack of sleep, but that just means that, you know, it'll be more fun. So, recall where we left off on Monday. We had talked about black holes as a way of life, the, um, how the, the fact that there doesn't seem to be a single canonical definition of black hole. There are many, many different notions at play, which makes, of course, the makes, I, I perhaps didn't emphasize enough, um, at least in my memory, I didn't, maybe I did at the time, but I will emphasize again, because it's, it's, it's important. I will emphasize even if again, because it's important. The fact that a black hole is not a univocal concept in this in physics. The fact that it is you know, so poly, so polysemous has so many different possible meanings and is used in so many different ways by so many different people and you know, researchers who are though at the end of the day they still want to talk to each other. They're all doing physics. They all want to interact with each other. They all want to help each other. They all want their work to be shared and to be of use to other people in the field. The fact that they are by and large all using a concept of black hole that varies sometimes quite significantly means that a lot of these foundational problems that we're, that we're, that we're talking about become much more difficult and subtle because one not only has to navigate you know, the, the, the kind of the foundational problem itself, so to speak, the foundational problem per se, one also has to try to figure out how the foundational problem and its, the possible ways of approaching it might depend on what kind of concept of black hole one is dealing with. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward. So we talked about causal structure, asymptotic structure, energy conditions, what the Einstein field equation is, what its role is, um, which reminds me that actually actually added a slide um, back here to that effect. Um, 
Uh, so recall that when we had finished discussing the Einstein field equation and the fact that as I claimed, it plays almost no role in, uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, proof of many important theorems and results. I'm sorry. I suggested- I'm Sorry, there is a question for you, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, hi, Eric. Thanks. Happy birthday. So that's my present. Thank you. Uh, Thank since you. you're starting with this lack of definition, uh, what can you tell us more about yesterday's talk where uh, Jose, I think, tried to give us another model of black holes without an event and the circularity? Since we don't have any definition for black hole, could that be as well considered a black hole since it derives from general relativity and masses orbited around it and we cannot observe it and so on and so forth? So I would so that that's a really interesting question. Um, oh, I just I just I hadn't been looking at the chat. Everyone's been wishing me happy birthday. That's that, that's so nice. Thank you so much. Um, Y'all are much better than all my siblings who always forget. So, um, and I'm even the baby of the family, you know, they come on, they should really remember, right? So, I would say that So um, when, when I first began thinking about this issue of what is of what is a black hole? How do you define it? You know, uh, how to, uh, what to, uh, you know, what to, what to, uh, physicists, different physicists mean by it. Um, I, I actually started making it a practice, like a kind of a habit of like it, every time I, every time I would talk to an, um, another physicist friend of mine, I would start the conversation just completely out of the blue by saying, Hey, so what's your definition of a black hole? And usually when you, when you do something like that, you, sh you kind of surprise them enough because it's a really unexpected question that you actually get a pretty honest answer. And so uh, uh, one of my favorites um, was when I was talking to Ravelli and you know, he, he, looked a little, he looked a little surprised. And, but then he said, you know, um, black holes are what, you know, ask, he's, and he pointed to the sky. He said, you know, astrophys uh, black holes are what astrophysicists, you know, point their telescopes at. And I, I, think that's, I think that's actually a really, really useful, interesting answer. So I take it that that's at least a large, I, I take it that that is at least, um, at the heart of what um, the kind of concept that Jose was using yesterday. But what's, it, what's really interesting about what was one of the very interesting things about Jose's talk, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not Jose, jo Joel. One of, the, one of the really interesting things about Joel's talk was that there were actually several different kind of notions of, of black hole in play, I think. So the, 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 this also is a, um, is a good lesson for doing foundational work. It's often the case that you know, physicists, they don't think by and large very philosophically in the way that you know, tra trained philosophers do, like you know, professional philosophers do. You know, sometimes when I say that, I feel like, you know, like uh, saying you know, pro professional philosophers, folks, don't try this at home. But you know, we, are, we are professional philosophers. We get trained in certain ways. We uh, not only trained, but we, have, but we by and large have certain predilections, ways of thinking that you know, kind of got us into this field in the first place. And very often, one of those ways of thinking is that we like things to be very clear. We like things to be very precise. Um, we like there to be no ambiguity. And physicists don't always operate like that. And that's not a criticism. It's actually a good thing because a lot of their work requires them to be a little wild and woolly and try a lot of things out and play ideas off against each other in a way that's not very you know, philosophically careful. That's a lot of the way that progress is made in physics. So I think that there were actually, and so when a physicist generally is talking about a black hole or doing research or writing a paper, I think very often they don't have in their mind a, a crisp, clear definition that they're using. They have, they, they have their own kind of personal idea which if you, add, if you press them on it, they'll be able to say a few things about and make more precise. But usually there are several different you know, facets and aspects of it in play at once. And I think that was what was going on in Joao's talk yesterday. So he was partly talking about black holes as you know, things, the, things astrophysicists point their telescope at. He was partly talking about black holes as the, classic, the classical definition, you know, the, um, 
the complement of the causal past of eternal infinity. Um, he was ta par partially talking about black holes in the way that in um, another way that astrophysicists talk about you know, relativistically compact objects that have um, you know, minimum mass, about two or three solar masses. So I, I think there, there were several notions in play and that's very characteristic of good work in physics, I think. The, uh, the, the, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, a bit. It opens new questions. Yeah, uh, of course. Jack, could you think about this object as an unobservable, inaccessible object that we model in different ways? It's just a theoretical object that came out of different theories, including Newton mechanics. And then we're trying to have a idealized, different idealized models that capture some, some interesting aspects about this unobservable, inaccessible objects, like we were doing with atoms in the 19th century, basically. And history of science is full of um, examples uh, like yeah, this. I, 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 am very, I am very sympathetic to that point of view. I mean, so for, first of all, I'll say, I don't think you have to be a realist to think that there really is, that there, that there really is you know, something out there in the middle of the Milky Way, this thing, Sagittarius A star, there really is that thing out there. That doesn't, that doesn't make, just, you know, believing that doesn't automatically make you, you know, some kind of traditional scientific realist. I, we, I, I, I'm not. Isn't the first observation was a star but, orbiting around yeah. an, uh, but, an un yeah. unobservable yeah. But, uh, yeah, but the, the, way, the way, the way that I think that, you know, theorizing in math works, the roles that they play in science is exactly along the lines that you're suggesting. We, you know, build our mathematical models, we try and hook them up to um, in, in various ways, we try and we try and hook them up to the, to experiment and observation. There's always some mismatch. There's always, there's always some slippage. There's always some arbitrariness. It, even in, even in very very mature, well entrenched theories, this happens. Uh, there's always some slippage, and you know, no, no model's perfect. I don't even know what that means for a model to be perfect. And you know, the, the models you know capture something about what we're trying to study. And if we can do that, we have we're succeeding really incredibly well, I think, yeah. There is another question. Oh, uh, hi, Eric. Sorry, my camera's not working, but- um, That's okay. Yeah, yeah. just just a much simpler clarification question. Uh, you mentioned here on this slide, you know, energy conditions, uh, but these are typically imp uh, imposed on the, the matter part of the stress energy tensor, right? not not like gravity itself, is that, is that right? Just a clarification. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. It's um, yeah, since that, that, that actually, so that you said that's a simple question. It's, a, it's actually a really interesting, it's actually a really interesting um, and kind of deep question, but uh, we don't have time to go into it, unfortunately, if I, if I actually want to get to what we're supposed to be talking about today. So I'll just say yes. Uh, okay, anything else before I move on? Okay, so on, on Monday, I mentioned that, you know, given the fact, so as I say in the slide, given the fact that so many of the results relied on in black hole physics do not depend on the, on the Einstein field equation, but rather only on energy conditions, how much do the problems we will consider bear on the validity of GR itself, if at all, rather than solely on that of QFT and particular theories of matter. And then, um, Uh, Yi Chen Luo, I hope I'm pronouncing your, um, your, your name some, somewhere in the ballpark of correctly, um, asked me um, a really great question in Slack and made me, um, he, he, pushed me he pushed me to clarify this claim. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad he did, because I think it is worth clarifying that the, the claim I made may make it, the, the, this claim I made may make it sound as though I think that the entire physical content of general relativity is you know, contained in the interpretation of the Einstein field equation. And that's not true. I probably did think that when I was, you know, kind of a young, naive, foolish, you know, first year grad student, you know, grad student doing, a, doing my PhD. But now that I'm, you know, an old foolish, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I had, I, had a fun, I had a funny email exchange with, with, with Ted Jacobson all night about something about what about whether Newton's constant is dimensionful. 
And since it was, you know, I was up till six in the morning and, you know, he's in the East Coast, so it was, it was kind of more reasonable time for him. We just we were, had this correspondence about it. And at one point he referred to himself as a crusty old fart. So I, I think, yes, I, I, I think I, if, if, Ted, if, if Ted can call himself that, now that I'm a foolish crusty old fart, I no longer believe that the physical content of general relativity is exhausted by interpretations of the Einstein field equation. There are actually many features of general relativity as a physical theory, as opposed to just you know, the mathematical theory of Lorentzian force geometries, that um, there are many, many more elements of general relativity than just the Einstein field equation. You know, matters whose interpretation, meaning, and physical significance don't depend on the Einstein field equation. And I, I give a long list here. You know, the geodesic principle, tidal forces, gravitational waves, the principle of equivalence, diffeomorphism invariance, healing fields, causal structure, affine structure, global topology, space-time dimension, the manifold's differential structure, the distinction among time-like, space-like, and null vectors, i.e. conformal structure, Lie derivatives, volume elements, spinner structure, and on and on and on. And um, what I'm, uh, what I, what I mean in saying that these, that, that these are kind of all structures and ideas that don't depend on the Einstein field equation is that one can make sense of, of, every, of, of each one of these and talk about them and reason about them and extract physical information about them while knowing nothing about the stress energy content of space time. So there is in fact, I think plenty of reason to think we, we may still need to modify some of general relativity in trying to find an adequate theory of quantum gravity, even if what we need to modify has nothing to do, you know, with the with with, with the Einstein field equation. Okay, I think that's the only. <laughs> Ichan, yes, your follow up. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. So it's a bit a little bit dark because I'm in Canada and it's uh, just a five a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Um, so just a quick comment and, and a follow-up question. So comment is that I totally agree with the form, your former, uh, former uh, comment on the uh, definition of uh, black holes that time. I mean, we first of all uh, increase it. So, I mean, the, the way Ravelli put in the data that we use the actual physics definition of black hole is totally good because uh, that's what we can observe. That's what we are sure, right? But the mathematical models or the way we manage to know the black holes are combined of uh, idealizations or models which are not perfectly uh, we know about black holes. So I'm agreed uh, with the field. And then the follow-up question about these slides is that, so if we don't take Einstein field equation as an interpretation, so how can you uh, understand the energy condition as energy conditions, right? Mm -hmm. so oh, how so can I, you yeah so uh, in what sense do you, do you mean energy condition if you don't use Einstein field equation so at least I mean, at most you can know the uh, remittance remittance 10 times the the new effect new factors something like that and you have the in, inequality there but do, how can you interpret that as the energy condition so in what sense do you mean that well so um, energy conditions are really quite subtle I mean this is um, I wrote like a 70 page paper I think on them. Uh, a few years ago, so it, the, the, it's a really good question. And again, I'll I'll, I'll try to be brief. But there, I mean, uh, I, I could I could go on about this for a while. I'm a philosopher, of course. I can go on, I can go on about this for a while. It's, it's part of the job. No matter what you ask, I should be just be able to go on about it for a while. So, but I won't. The answer is that um, energy conditions in one sense just depend on the stress energy tensor. And one can, one can um, give operational significance to the stress energy tensor in many, many ways that make, that make no reference to the role it plays in coupling the curvature by way of the outside field equation. And that's actually a good thing because one wants to use energy conditions not only in general relativity, but if one wants to study alternative theories of gravity, you know, FR gravity, FT gravity, various Lovelock Langsos uh, kinds of gravity, Jan, you know, Jan, Jan Simon's gravity, you know, there, there, there's just a whole, there, there's a whole menagerie of alternative theories out there. And all, all, not quite, but almost all of them 
use have um, have a have a structure that is essentially the same as the stress energy tensor in general relativity. And one wants to be able to talk about energy conditions in these alternative theories as well. And one can, because generally speaking, most of the energy conditions, um, most of the kind of point-wise classic energy conditions, in fact, I think all of them, none of them, you, you can formulate each of them only by reference to the, to the stress energy tensor. So you, 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 there, in that sense, you don't need the Einstein field equation to uh, talk about what the stress energy content of space time is in a limited sense. Once you assume, once you impose the Einstein field equation, then the stress energy content of space time becomes a much richer idea because you now have many more ways of operation for, for, one, for one reason, because you now have many more ways of operationalizing what you mean by stress energy. But there does, but there does seem to be some uh, kind of a core notion or a set of core notions of stress energy that one can talk about without assuming a definite way that the stress energy relates to something like the space-time geometry itself, and that's what that's what allows one to you to use energy conditions in all in different theories of gravity. Uh, does that help? Yeah. Thank oh. you. Okay, so let's pick up uh, now. So uh, we then, uh, so then, just to conclude the, the the summary of Monday, which I thought would take like three minutes, but is now taking like twenty minutes. Um, so we talked about the three best theories, general uh, our three best our, our current three best theories: general relativity, quantum field theory, thermodynamics how they don't seem to fit together or at all very, very naturally or easily, except in the very special case of a black hole where it seems miraculously or magically, they all three come together and in seemingly somewhat harmoniously, but it's that seemingly somewhat that is really at issue here. So we're gonna try and figure out, we're gonna try and get, get more clarity today on exactly how our three best theories really work with each other and work against each other in trying to understand the behavior of the properties and the behaviors of black holes when quantum effects are taken into account. So the context for the rest of the discussion today, at least for a while, so for the remainder of this part of the talk is that unless explicitly stated otherwise, well, we, we will use the classic definition of a, back, of a black hole based on the idea of an isolated system that is a region of no escape. So uh, in, fut in future lectures, i.e. I hope later on, uh, later on today, when we actually get to the information loss paradox, um, we will expand our repertoire of, what we, of possible meanings of black holes. But just for the moment, we'll, we'll stick to this meaning. And for this to make sense, for the idea of there to be a region of no escape to make sense, we need a region such that, a space-time region such that having reached it, one has indubitably escaped, i.e. gotten arbitrarily far away from every other region in space-time. And, but that is exactly what the idea of asymptotic infinity captures. Once you know, once you've gotten you know, asymptotically far away, you, you escaped from the interior of space-time. So get so kind of getting out to infinity is a good criterion for what one means by escape. So now you want to look for regions from which you can't get out to infinity. That's going to be our region of no escape. And the precise definition of that in you know in the classic setting that was worked out somewhat arduously over several years, starting from about 1960 five to about 1971 or so that uh, you can you can see primarily it was Penrose, Hawking and Garoche all kind of talking to each other who, who over the course of those six years finally came up finally worked their way towards this canonical definition that the black hole region in a space time is the set of all points such that no future directed causal curve from one of those points can reach future null infinity can reach sky plus or a, a little more compact, one can say a little more compactly, the black hole region is the complement to the chronological past of eternal infinity. So 
this is just what I said, for an asymptotically flat space time, the black hole region B is the space time manifold minus the causal past of future null infinity. So the causal past of future null infinity is any point, includes any point from which one can draw a causal curve that reaches future null infinity. That's the definition of the causal past. So the black hole region is all those points that from which you can't do that. And the event horizon then is just the boundary between these two regions. So you have the outside region, points from which you can draw a causal curve to reach uh, at, you know, future null infinity, the black hole region, the points from which you cannot draw a causal curve and reach future null infinity, and the event horizon is the boundary between those two regions. And here is um, an, a, just a nice picture to you know, get the juices flowing. I find pictures are always very useful to help get, uh, kind of give, give flesh and deepen understanding of these somewhat dry, precise technical definitions. So here is future null infinity. Here is a, a body of matter collapsing to form a black hole. At this point right here, the body of matter has collapsed so as to form, uh, it, it's now collapsed enough, condensed enough so that it's reached its own Schwarzschild radius. And so the event, uh, it's now inside its event horizon. This is the singularity that according to classical general relativity will form. And so now you can see that any point out here, so in these, pen, in these Penrose diagrams, in these space-time diagrams, recall I, um, I said that the Penrose diagrams are arranged such that the null, the null cones are all everywhere at every point um, kind of homogeneously for um, the null lines go out at 45 degree angles or, or, or pi four radians. So from any point in here, so the, the event horizon itself is, an, is, a null, is a null surface. And from any point in here, you know, one can draw a causal curve that reaches future null infinity. Any point in the black hole region, one can't. If one tries to cross the event horizon, one inevitably must make the curve space-like. But we don't think that space-like curves can represent the motion of real physical systems. So once you're behind the black hole, every single curve, every single path you might want to follow inevitably leads you into the singularity. So there's a, um, one way of kind of making that idea vivid is that once you've passed the event horizon, the inevitability of reaching the singularity is, if you like, metaphysically the same as the inevitability of just experiencing the passage of time. You know, if you're if you're behind the event horizon, as time passes, you just inevitably go towards the singularity. And here's um, a non-Penrose diagram that uh, kind of is, is some, some, I think, probably more like how that captures more the intuitive idea of what people think about when they think about these things. So here, the, the, the curvature of space-time is represented in part by the way the, the, null cones, the, the null cones are kind of tipping over, and they might be rotating a bit, they might be contracting or expanding a bit relative to each other. So the, the collapsing matter as soon as it reaches its Schwarzschild radius, the event horizon forms. And that's represented by the fact that if I'm an observer out here, I can always thread through the null cones you know, in such a way that I, I remain outside the event horizon. And I can, do, I can just keep on doing that indefinitely. So I, 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 can, I can reach infinity if I have enough fuel. But the event horizon, as you can see, um, at the event horizon, the null cones are such that the null cones are tan, part of the null cones, the, the, the outgoing null lines are tangent to the event horizon. So that every single causal, every single timeline curve at this point, which must lie inside the, 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 the null cone, takes you into the black hole. And since the, 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 the null cones are tipping over more and more and more, as you follow any curve, any timeline or causal curve into the black hole, you inevitably get sucked towards the singularity. Okay. Now beware a common misconception. 
Black holes aren't always super dense, super compact, super strong gravity objects. Here's a, here's a really nice example to, um, to, to, to make this point. So imagine that, imagine that you could take all the stars in the Milky Way and maybe you could attach a little rocket to every single star in the Milky Way. And you could start pushing them all towards galactic center. And you do it kind of slowly and gradually in such a way that they all keep their relative proportionate distances to each other as you're, as you're pushing them towards galactic center. It's a very simple calculation. It's like a one line calculation that they will all, that th th this collection of matter, you can think of it as a, as a dust field, if you like, on cosmological scales, stars are basically dust points. They, all the stars in the Milky Way will fall within their joint Schwarzschild radius. So, so, you know, all the stars in the Milky Way have a, have a definite mass. The Milky Way has a definite mass. So it has an, it has an associated Schwarzschild radius. And you can push all the stars inside that Schwarzschild radius. But it turns out the Schwarzschild radius, the mass is so big, so the Schwarzschild radius is so large for the Milky Way that you can fit all the stars inside of it long before they become anywhere near touching each other. So the average density, and so a black hole is formed. They're, up, they're all inside their Schwarzschild radius. An event horizon is formed. But the average density of matter in that system is just infinitesimal by terrestrial standards because the stars are all really still spread out and it's, it's almost all still empty space between them. So the, the gravity at the event horizon is just negligible. The curvature is, 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 is almost zero, even though there is a black hole. So there is, in other words, nothing necessarily unphysical or mysterious or exotic about the interior of an event horizon that, that you form from the aggregation of matter. And this was something that I think really confused a lot of physicists for a very long time. Um, it's why it, it took um, it took the astrophysics the astrophysics community really struggled with this and didn't want to accept the physical relevance of black holes well into probably a lot of them into the 1980s. The theoreticians like you know Penrose and Hawking and Yurovich and Carter and Israel and Misner and all those great guys who were revolutionizing the field in the 60s, they had no problem accepting black holes because they recognized ideas like this. The astrophysicists um, really still thought of black holes as extremely exotic objects and they weren't really sure that they were relevant. That's another very interesting history. No time to talk about it, but yeah, it's, it's fun to think about. Okay, let's talk about black hole mechanics. How, what is the behavior of black holes? And we're still in the purely classical regime at the moment. And so the perhaps the, the deepest, most fundamental, the single most fundamental fact about classical black holes is captured by the, so, the so-called no hair theorem. A stationary electrovac black hole is completely characterized by three numbers, its mass, its angular momentum, and its electric charge. By stationary, I mean there's a time-like killing field, an asymptotically time-like killing field. Uh, in other words, there's a there's a um, there's a, a symmetry of the space of the, of the space-time metric that is such that if an observer is following the orb is respect is, if an observer's motion respects the orbits of the symmetry as the observer moves forward in time, the observer the metric will seem not to change. The metric so the space-time geometry looks the same as the observer moves forward in time. So, that, so that's, it, that, so in other words, we can think of the black hole as not, as not manifesting any dynamical behavior. It's in equilibrium, it's, it's not changing over time. Electrovac means that essentially um, there's either no matter present, it's vacuum, or else we do, or else Will allow a, will allow a, Mac, a, a free Maxwell field, i.e., no electric charges anywhere, except maybe in the black hole. And this is, is the this no hair theorem. It's really remarkable. Given the nonlinearity of the Einstein field equations, and um, one it's I, it's prime it's a priori I think really surprising. Given the infamous richness of 
solutions to non to non to you know nonlinear partial differential equations. In the Einstein field equation, if you write it all if you write it all out and say you know in uh, coordinate in coordinate component form, that forms ten nonlinear in the vacuum case, it forms ten hi highly coupled nonlinear quasi hyperbolic symmetric partial differential equations. They're really complicated. So a priori, there's no reason to expect that you would get only basically a single very, very, very narrowly restricted class of solutions that have an event, that have a classical event horizon. And that you can characterize any, any member of that family by exactly three numbers. Now, the, the reason why this is, I say that this is the first hint that black holes have thermodynamical behavior is because this is just like an ordinary thermodynamical system. My cup of tea, which is now empty, unfortunately, so imagine there's tea in this cup. You know, when you, when you think about the fine details of its microstructure, you know, all, all the, it's really, really super complex. There's, you know, there's about 10 to the 23rd molecules in there, you know, a lot of them, it's not just water. A lot of the molecules are these in, are these enormous, really complex organic molecules. You know, from the, from, from the tea leaves, and it's there. The, it, 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 when I'm actually sitting it down, and I think it's a constant temperature, it's really not constant temperature. It's probably a little. Um, there's a mild temperature gradients. It's going to be a little, a little cooler near the near the edge of the cup, and the temp the temperature gradients. You know, it gets gets a little warmer as you go towards the center, and there's even though it looks like, again, it's an equilibrium, there are these little pressure gradients and whirls and eddies and vortices and statistical fluctuations and T is slowly evaporating. And it's a really, when you look at the micro, when you really think about the microphysics, it's an incredibly complex system. And yet miraculously, at macro scales, we can, we can basically, for, you know, for many, many, for the purposes of many kinds of investigations, we can represent all the all the base, all the facts about the physics of the T we need using two numbers. Say it's it's energy and its entropy, or it's pressure and its volume, it's pressure and its temperature. There are many many choices of the two numbers one can make, and that completely independently of what the actual micro configuration of all the really complex stuff that makes up the cup of tea is, and that's exactly how black holes behave. It, it seems like no matter what collapse to the form of the black hole. It could be, you know, a star and it could be in John Ehrman's really evocative conceit, you know, uh, quadrillions of televisions playing, playing Nixon's checker speech or, you know, quadrillions of dirty socks or doesn't matter. Whatever the you know, micro constituents, so to speak, of the black hole is, whatever it formed from, as soon as it settles down to equilibrium after it's formed, it is completely characterized by three numbers. And also, it turns out black holes behave, um, th their behavior in this, in the context we're, we're dealing with, uh, asymptotically flat, you know, uh, uh, space time, astro asymptotically flat, electrovac, uh, stationary, well, not always stationary, space times with the classic event horizon, obey. It turns out four laws that look like they're in almost perfect formal analogy with the four laws of classical thermodynamics. So there's a zero law in thermodynamics. The temperature T is constant throughout a body in thermal equilibrium. For black holes, the surface gravity kappa is constant over the event horizon of a stationary black hole. So again, as I already intimated um, when talking, when explaining what I, what I meant by stationary, station, stationary not changing in time is, it's, is basically the it it's, seems like, and the zeroth law gives us some reason, more reason to think that stationarity is the appropriate notion of equilibrium for a black hole. And if at least formally, this analogy suggests that the surface gravity kappa plays, uh, if at least formally, is analogous to the temperature. At this point, this is all just mathematical formalism. We have no reason right now to think that kappa is a physical temperature. It's just right now that there's an, there's an amusing isomorphism between the mathematics. And that amusing, isom that amusing isomorphism is carried even further. Uh, we have a first law. Oh, I, you know, I, 
I, I can't resist remarking here that to my mind, one of the most interesting and problematic issues in the study of black hole thermodynamics is that this is not really the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The real zeroth law of thermodynamics is any two systems that are in, that are in thermal equilibrium with each other. If, if you have, um, are, will be in thermal, uh, let's see, um, if, uh, my lack of sleep is, is now showing up. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm having a little difficulty formula, formulating my thoughts. Here it is. If you have two thermal systems that are in equilibrium, that are each in equilibrium with a third, then they are in equilibrium with each other. So I have three, I have three systems. Two, two of them are each separately in thermal equilibrium with the third one. That implies they are in equilibrium with each other. In other words, thermal, the, the relationship of being in thermal equilibrium is a transitive relationship. That's the real zero law in ordinary thermodynamics. And that implies, in fact, that the temperature T is constant throughout a body in thermal equilibrium. So what we're calling the zeroth law here is the consequence of the real zeroth law. And it actually really matters because you know, classical thermodynamics is a lot more than just the four laws. It's things like being able to construct a state space of, um, of equilibrium states. It's being able to calculate thermodynamical potentials from the, from the, extens from the extensive you know, um, parameters of state. Um, it's the Clausius and the Kelvin postulates. It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of things. And for almost all those things, you need transitivity of equilibrium. It's absolutely fundamental to thermodynamics that equilibrium is transitive. This statement, constancy of temperature, does not get you transitivity of equilibrium. It's strictly weaker. So the fact that we don't seem to be able to formulate a true zeroth law for black holes you know, two black holes that are in that are in equilibrium with a third or in equilibrium with each other. We don't we don't know how to um, how, how to make that kind of idea precise or really make it work at all. Already gives one a clue that if there is a therm a real thermodynamics of black holes, it's going to be a little different than the thermodynamics of ordinary classical systems. That's an incredibly interesting problem to think about. I think. Okay, so we have not only this. Uh, weakened form of the zeroth law, but I'll just call, I'll just call it the zeroth law because everyone does. We have also the first law of energy conservation. In thermodynamics, you know, the, the change in energy is the Gibbs term temp, uh, for the change in energy for, for a body in equilibrium is the Gibbs term temperature times change in entropy plus the amount of work done on the system. And for black holes, we have uh, that the change in mass of a black hole under any you know, uh, uh, infinitesimal perturbation, say, is the surface gravity of the black hole times the change in area, plus whatever rotational work was done, like spinning the black hole up or extracting rotational uh, energy from the black hole by the Penrose process. And again, the mathematics, it, we have this perfect isomorphism, it seems, so per, you know, perfect, it's close enough, between the mathematics. And here, once again, we get, we get another hint that the analogy might be a little bit more than just purely formal because the quantities on the left-hand sides, energy and thermodynamics, mass for black holes, relativistically, those are the same, you know, E equals MC squared, we all know that. And you know, energy and mass are, are in some mysterious deep way, the same property, relativistically speaking. So we have this, this these, rela the, these relations that are formally identical, but a little bit more, they actually talk about the same physical quantity, energy, mass energy. And again, if you look at, if you just compare term by term, the surface gravity kappa, it looks like it's playing the same role as temperature as in, as in the zeroth law. We now have um, the area of the black hole playing the role of entropy. There's not, there's not really a good notion in this context of the, pre, of the pressure volume work term. So let's just kind of ignore, let's ignore that for the moment. But rotational energy, rotational, rotational work, there's a perfect analogy. For spinning black holes, there's a notion of its angular velocity. 
and there's a notion of its angular momentum, and you get this, this kind of rotational work term that's exactly identical to, the, to what you get in the first law of classical thermodynamics. There's also a second law for thermodynamics. Entropy never decreases in any physical process. And for black holes, the area of an event horizon never decreases in any physical process. This is the famous, this is Hawking's famous area theorem. I think he proved in 1971. And just again, if you're a history buff, um, I'm pretty sure that it's actually in that paper, in the 1971 paper where he proves this, that is the first appearance in print of the classic canonical definition of a black hole as you know, the complement of the causal of the causal past of feature null infinity. So again, you know, kind of cute analogy, but is it telling us anything physical or is it just is this a formal analogy? Who knows? Then there's the third law of the Nernst theorem in thermodynamics. You know, T equals zero is not achievable by any physical process. For black holes, surface gravity equals zero is not achievable by any physical process. There are a lot of really interesting conceptual and technical problems with the third law, even in classical thermodynamics. Well, I mean, in, in, in a way, the, it's, not, it's not even a, a classical um, principle, it's really, you really need quantum mechanics to make sense of, 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 of the Nernst theorem, which makes it incredibly weird that Nernst discovered it in 1908 when there wasn't even quantum mechanics, but it's one, one, one of the weird facts about it. And the third law for black holes is also quite problematic in many ways. So we're not really gonna be talking about the third law very much. Uh, uh, we're not gonna talk about it at all, really, in, for the rest of these lectures. I put it here to just, just for the sake of completeness, that there is, if you think about the four laws of the four laws of classical thermodynamics, there are perfect an analogs in for classical black holes. And actually, if um, it, you may believe, as I as I as I think, as I've been convinced, that there's actually a fifth law of classical thermodynamics, what Harvey Brown and Yosu Fink call the minus first law. And in thermodynamics, that is the claim that isolated thermodynamical systems tend to approach a unique equilibrium state. And there's the exactly exact analog of that in for classical black holes, isolated non-stationary black holes tend to settle down to a unique stationary state, the Kerr Newman space time. That's the, the Kerr Newman space time is the complete family of classic electrovac space times that have, a, that have an event horizon that are characterized, that the, all the geometry of the, of the space time is characterized by three numbers. So, in, in particular, Kerr Newman space time, the family of all Kerr Newman space times includes the Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild black holes, Reiser Nordstrom black holes, and Kerr black holes. So, it really does seem like classical black holes are putting aside the issue of all the other stuff that, that that thermodynamics includes, which I mentioned earlier when talking about the zeroth law, at least with regard to these five really fundamental principles. Black holes, the behavior and properties of black holes really seem to be an essentially perfect formal analogy isomorphism with classical thermodynamics, with surface gravity playing the role of temperature and area playing the role of entropy. So now let's now let's uh, before we discuss any more about this analogy, let's um, which we will do by taking by taking quantum effects into account. Let's introduce a framework in which it makes sense to take quantum effects into account. And there are two frameworks, or if you like, really, there's one framework. One of, one of which is a kind of. Um, the simplification of the of the big, there's a big one, semi-classical gravity, and then there's a kind of a simpler one, quantum field theory and curved space time that fits within semi-classical gravity. So it is given all given all the problem, prima facie conflicts and tensions between general relativity and quantum field theory, it is perhaps surprising to learn that there is in fact a consistent rigorous theory of quantum fields living on classical relativistic space times. Um, either the the algebraic or the axiomatic formulation of quantum field theory on curved spacetime. And this framework, in this framework, the, the basic 
these structures are a fixed background classical space-time geometry. So maybe, maybe a black hole space-time, classical black hole space-time and non-interacting quantum fields propagating as test matter um, against this classical fixed geometry. So we, we treat them as, as free fields. They're not, the, the quantum field, the stress energy content of the quantum fields is not contributing to the curvature of the space-time geometry. It's a, very it's a very standard move to make in any physical theory. You know, if you're doing, if you're doing Maxwell theory, you very often, don't, uh, and you're studying the motion of electric charges, you very often don't consider the contribution of the, of the charged particles own electric fields to the background Maxwell field who's, you know, that the particle is moving in. You're treating the charged particle as test matter. In gravity, you very often treat, when you're studying the motion of particles or little systems, you very often don't consider the contribution of that system's test center, of that system's stress energy to, you basically tr treat it as being so small, the mass is being so small that its effect on the, on the curvature is negligible. So you just treat it as being affected by gravity, you know, being governed, its behavior being governed by the curvature, but its, prop, but its mass energy not contributing to the curvature. Very standard move. That's what quantum field theory and curved space time does. Um, it's, there, there are also kind of standard canonical and Lagrangian, and Lagrangian formulations of quantum field theory and curved space time, but they're incredibly messy and they raise met yet many more mathematical and physical problems. So we're, we're not gonna worry, we're not gonna worry about them uh, today. But you know, freedom is kind of scary. People like, you know, constraints and rules and regulations. And so we, introduce, we don't want to treat the quantum fields as pure test matter. It's not coupling with the space-time geometry, not contributing to the, to the curvature of the space-time geometry by way of the unsent field equation. We want to have, we want to be able to try and take account of all the, all the kind of causal relationships, all the ways that space-time geometry and matter are interacting with each other. So we want in some way or other to shackle the, the quantum fields to the curvature. And uh, for various historical reasons, this is almost, physicists almost always uh, call this taking back reaction into account. And what that means is in semi-classical gravity, one represents the contribution of the stress energy content of the quantum fields to the classical geometry by way of what's called the semi-classical Einstein field equation. And what that is, is on the, on the left-hand side, one has the classical Einstein tensor. So this is just the, the regular Einstein tensor of the classical space-time geometry. And on the right-hand side, one has a two index, you know, symmetric, covariantly divergence-free tensorial object, but it's not the stress energy tensor of, of, of a classical field. It's rather the expectation value of the stress energy content of the quantum field considered as a quantum operator. The expectation value as computed uh, relative to whatever you know, state the quantum field is in. Now, even though there is a, there is a completely rigorous and very, very elegant and beautiful theory of quantum uh, uh, framework for quantum field theory in curved space time, there is no completely rigorous mathematical theory for the sem that includes the semi-classical Einstein field equation. It's just really too complicated. So um, there are only the standard formulations that you can do it using Lagrangians, the S matrix, path integrals, canonical formulations, Hamilton, Hamiltonian Jacobi, perturbative warts and all, non-renormalizability, all the problems that you inherit from standard uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, blue collar quantum field theory, the quantum field theory that actually you know, goes into CERN and, uh, and, and works for its living, not the beautiful algebraic quantum field theory that mathematicians think about. So you, you inherit all the conceptual and technical problems here. In the and they're all of course exacerbated by the fact that you, have, that you don't have a fixed space-time geometry background like Minkowski space-time. Now the space-time the space -time background itself is dynamical and is interacting with the quantum fields. And it's just, there are so many in really interesting, fascinating, deep, technical, physical, conceptual, philosophical questions about the status of the semi-classical Einstein field equation. And philosophers have, paid atten have attended to 
almost none of them. So I, I very strongly urge all, all the young philosophers here, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, to really think about all the, all the really interesting philosophical problems that the semi-classical Einstein field equation raises. I'll mention a few a little bit later, a few, a few specific ones a little bit later in the, in the lecture. Excuse me, Eric, uh, there is a question uh, from... Uh, right, so what, what, why semi-classical? Um, because, um, so th this is actually a very common terminology in, um, in uh, that I believe originally came from condensed matter physics. So um, it's semi-classical in, the, in exactly the way, for instance, that the, um, that the, uh, that the Haranoff bohm effect is semi-classical. You are taking quantum, you're taking quantum matter and coupling it in some way to a classical system. So in a Haranoff bohm you're, um, you're, you're treating the, the kind of background Maxwell field as classical, but you're treating the, the charged matter as, as quantum. In a lot of condensed matter physics, you treat um, some properties um, as so. Like if you're studying phonons in um, in, in a fluid, you know the little quantized set, you know acoustic excitations. You treat the background fluid as classical matter, and you treat the phonons, these little quantum excitations, as quantum, and you couple them. In fact, using an equation very much like this, there's a there. Are, there are terms that are, that are like classical classical fluid on the left hand side, and on the right hand side there are terms that are the that are the expectation values of the quantum properties of the phonons on the right hand so side. One can say semi classical in the sense that we presuppose that the space time is governed by general relativity and non non not quantized. Exactly. Okay. Thank. You. General relativity is classical. Space time geometry is classical. Matter is quantum. So. Semi-classical, partially classical, that's the picture. So really, the fundamental question here in semi-classical gravity, if I can allow myself to be a little um, flowery in, express, in my expression, how does the sober, rigorous, and precise you know, Apollonian convocation of classical Lorentzian geometry and the exuberantly inexact and informal you know, Dionysian Fandango quantum field theory come in the mutually fruitful contact. So as to give the joy of material content to the former and the restrained discipline of consistent, of consistent structure to the latter. Well, this is a very deep question that we don't have a good answer to yet, but we'll be examining some of the aspects of how to try to answer that question as we continue. As I've already remarked, there are many severe technical, physical, and deep technical, physical, and conceptual problems for both QFT, CST, and for semi-classical gravity, but we must regretfully put them all aside. I mean, there are so many, I don't even try, dare try to list them all. But it, um, I, I actually have a long unpublished manuscript where it basically is nothing but a list of all the conceptual pro technical conceptual problems that I've, I've come across and thought of and thinking about all this stuff. So. If you're curious, email me and I'll, I'll send you my, my extremely long list. Okay, now we can talk about the Hawking effect. So, so far in the dialectic of this lecture, of this, of this presentation, of this way of thinking about uh, black hole, the physics of black holes, uh, yeah, uh, Rawad, question. Uh, yeah, and thinking about this problem, do some is it consistent the semi-classical gravity or do you have some inconsistency problem with locality or equivalence principle or stuff like this yeah that's a good question um so yeah there, there are, i mean there are many different senses of consistency that one that one might invoke in in the context of like just purely mathematical uh, pure, uh, pure pure mathematical physics and essentially in in basically every sense of consistency one might want to reasonably ask about the semi-classical Einstein field equation is not consistent. Um, it's uh, it the, um, it it generally speaking doesn't have a well-posed initial value pro, uh, initial value formulation in the sense of Hadamard. It's subject to severe inst instabilities, um, divergences, um, uh, causal pathologies. It's it's so incredibly difficult even just to calculate the the operator, the stress energy tensor operator of a, of a quantum field, even the absolute simplest cases, you know, ma ma massless free Klein-Gordon, you can't get simpler than that. 
and calculating the stress energy density for uh, operator for that is enormously, enormously, it's a, it's a Mount Everest of difficulty. And then to you know, calculate the expectation value of that for, for any kind of, of, of vacuum state, just you know, exponentiates the difficulty. And then trying to, set, trying to set that equal to you know, this really complicated geometrical object and sol solving for that. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, there are, there's a sense in which the semi-classical Einstein field equation, as I say, it just really is wildly inconsistent in many ways. So in practice, one has to be extremely careful in handling it and trying to extract physical content from what looks like a formal, so when one gets something like a formal solution to it, one has to be extremely careful in trying to extract the physical content from that solution in order to try to avoid all the mathematical pathologies that, that can arise. Okay, so in, so at this, at this point in the kind of dialectic of the, of, of the presentation of this way of thinking about black holes, we, we, have, we have reached the point where we now see that classical black holes have this really beautiful formal analogy with ordinary thermodynamical systems. But right now, but we still aren't really thinking of this analogy as anything more than a formal analogy. Are these, are these the laws of black hole mechanics, or just the you know, classical dynamical behavior of black holes? Or are these the laws of black hole thermodynamics? Should we really start thinking about black holes as thermodynamical systems? And classically, when we just exclude all quantum effects, just think about classical black holes and classical matter, the analogy is purely formal. At least that's what orthodoxy says. Um, I, I have a somewhat infamous um, unpublished manuscript, although I think it's actually gonna be published pretty soon, finally. I finally got around to trying to publish it, um, uh, in which I argue that in fact, there is a consistent thermodynamics for purely classical black holes. Uh, almost no one believes it. Um, I, I myself only believe it about half the time. But let's just accept, let's just accept orthodoxy, that there is no consistent thermodynamics for classical black holes. And there are, re there are prima facie very strong arguments for saying this. Um, one is that classical black holes are perfect absorbers, they admit nothing. So based on, you know, the Planckian notion of temperature, you know, the, the, um, the, the temperature of a, of a body as defined by its black body, by the, by the power spectrum of its black body radiation, classical black holes have a temperature of absolute zero, irrespective of what value the surface gravity has. There's this really elegant, infamous thought experiment that Garoch proposed in a symposium at Princeton in 1970 that Beckenstein was giving when Beckenstein was first thinking about these things. Uh, uh, it, it's, I won't go through it. It's, 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 a, it's an incredibly elegant, cool thought experiment. But basically the thought, the thought experiment seems to show that, for a, that you can use a classical black hole as a heat sink to transform heat into work with 100% efficiency. And then by, you know, by, 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 the efficient, by Carnot's efficiency theorem, that shows that has the implication again that temperature of the of the classical black hole must be absolute zero. And anyway, just from a physical point of view, you know, area, you know, physical geometrical area is nothing like entropy. You know, area actually has a dimension, physical dimension. Entropy is just a dimensionless number, and you know, area is just you know, it's area. Entropy is something like a measure of how many different ways. Something can something can be con, uh, configured at the micro level and still look the same at the macro level. What what does area have to do with that? And surface gravity is nothing like temperature. Again, they have different physical dimensions, and you know it, it doesn't really seem like if you know if if I have my, if I have my glass bulb thermometer and I stick it against a body that has a certain surface gravity, there's just no reason to expect that the thermometer will read a value equal to the surface gravity of the of the body. So. The orthodoxy says that classically this analogy is purely formal. And so the way to think, even though there is this really extraordinary, it's almost perfect mathematical isomorphism. And so the, the, the way to think about that, according to orthodoxy, basically is you know, like everything in its mother in physics has the equations of motion of a simple harmonic oscillator. You know, but we don't think that just because you know alternating current circuits and pendulums both have the equate, both have, have identical equations of motion in you know the inappropriate regimes. You know they're both simple harmonic oscillators. That doesn't 
I mean, we think that alternating circuit currents physically are pendulums. They just so they, it just so happens kind of by not not exactly by accident, but it's just but there's no deep reason. There's no deep connection between the two. They're not they're not physically or metaphysically the same thing. They just kind of have the same dynamics. And that's all that so orthodoxy thinks in the in the classical regime. And if you're curious, ask me sometime about um, Alain Cohn's wonderful laws of asshole mechanics. They're really funny. But, orthodoxy says, let's take quantum effects into account, which Hawking did in the early 70s. And he discovered then that a black hole behaves like a perfect black body in the sense of ordinary statistical thermodynamics. In the presence of a quantum field in its vacuum state, Thermal radiation with the Planckian power spectrum characteristic of a perfect black body at a fixed temperature that is equal to the surface gravity times some numerical constants. That this perfect black body radiation is generated in the neighborhood of the horizon of a stationary black hole. It seems like the black hole glows just like a lump of smoldering coal, even though nothing, not even light, should be able to escape from it. And so, so now, the black hole is emitting black body radiation, it seems, and that black body radiation miraculously encodes the physical temperature that, that's equal to the surface gravity as the laws of black hole mechanics made us expect. So now we think, oh, now we can take the physical and the formal analogy seriously. In a sense, now we can think it's, it's a truly physical analogy that the laws of black hole mechanics really are the laws of ordinary thermodynamics extended into this new regime. Black holes really are thermodynamical systems. And the way that you then get from, so Hawking radiation gives you a reason to think that surface gravity really is temperature. It does not give you a reason by itself to think that area really is entropy. For that, you have to look at Bekenstein's generalized second law and as Garocha's infamous thought experiment showed, and Wheeler's early, you know, thought, the thought experiments Wheeler came up with in the late 60s that drove Bekenstein to start thinking about these things, it seems incredibly easy <clears throat> to violate the standard second law when black holes are around. Just, you know, take your favorite highly entropic system, like my cup of tea, and just toss it into a black hole. And now the entropy of the world outside the event horizon, which is a, caus a causally isolated system, spontaneously decreases. That seems like that, that is the definition of a violation of, this, of, the, of the classical second law. You have a causally isolated system and its entropy spontaneously decreases. So Bekenstein proposed the generalized second law that total entropy, we, we, now, we now are, in order to say the second law, we are forced to attribute an entropy to, the, to, to black holes. And through some rather ingenious arguments, even before Hawking's calculations, Bekenstein concluded that the entropy of the black hole must be proportional to its area. And so he proposed that total entropy, black hole area, plus entropy of ordinary matter outside never decreases. There are now many powerful, of course, purely theoretical arguments supporting it. There's a really wonderful paper by Aaron Wall called 10 Proofs of the Generalized Second Law from around 2012. I urge you to go read it, it's fantastic. And the validity of the generalized second law is the best argument we have for attributing a physical entropy to black holes for saying that area really is entropy. All other attempts I know of to argue that area is entropy um, beg questions left and right. This, to my mind, this argument from uh, saving the validity of the, of the second law is really the best reason to, to think that area is a, physical temp, uh, is a physical entropy. And so the overwhelming consensus today is that black holes truly are thermodynamical objects and the laws of black hole mechanics just are the laws of ordinary thermodynamics extended into a new regime to cover any type of physical system. And one very useful historical analogy for the situation is to think about how thermodynamics in the 19th century was extended to encompass electromagnetic radiation. You know, or thermodynamics up until about 1860s, 1870s, basically just covered, you know, kind of ordinary fluids, solids, gas. No one had the foggiest clue that this kind of black body radiation stuff, which they didn't even know what it was then because Maxwell, you know, Maxwell hadn't yet shown that 
that light is just electromagnetic radiation. People just knew that when stuff was hot, it could explode. They somehow, they, they figured out nonetheless that this kind of glowing radiation, whatever exactly it is, in order to save the second law, one has to attribute an entry to it. In order to save the zeroth law, one has to attribute a temperature to it. And that's the way that they extended the laws of thermodynamics to include what we would now call electromagnetic radiation. So the same thing is happening here. We have thermodynamics of ordinary matter and electromagnetic fields, and we're extending it to cover a new class of physical systems, black holes. But what on earth can that mean? Because how can an empty, locally undistinguished region of space-time, because remember, the event horizon is locally undistinguished. It's a global object. You can't tell locally if, if there's an, where an event horizon is. How can it have thermodynamical properties? I mean, it's, diff, it's really difficult to think of two more different quantities than entropy and spatial area, unless you're thinking of temperature and surface gravity. How can these possibly be identical? And this is, I think, a very deep problem for the concept, for conceptual understanding of inner theory relations, what it means for a quantity to be the same as represented in different theories. Again, wonderful problem for, for young philosophers to look at and think about. And there are many other differences that really make this, this identification of black holes with thermodynamical systems difficult to understand. The laws of ordinary thermodynamics are empirical generalizations. The laws of black hole mechanics are theorems of pure differential geometry. They are really are, rigor, except for the third law, let's put that aside. The third law always causes problems. But the zero, the first and second law are really theorems of different, are mathematical theorems of differential geometry, which we give physical interpretation to by invoking the Einstein field equation. So if we really wanna think of them as the laws of thermodynamics extended in this new regime, what, is it, how, 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 what does it mean physically? How is it that what had been empirical generalizations now become mathematical theorems? How can they possibly be the same principles? So now we're, in a, now we're at a stage to talk about Hawking radiation. So I'll leave that question open. I'll leave all those questions open, but for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to assume mostly that it, kind of, it makes sense to think about black holes as thermodynamical systems, that we kind of have, we have a, a loose grip on what that means, and let's march forward and see how much progress we can make with that loose grip. So I'm going to sketch a picture of Hawking radiation. I'm not going to describe any particular de derivation because um, the rough, intuitive ones that you can go through pretty quickly they tend to be badly misleading. I think almost all of them in in various ways, both physically and conceptually. And the precise rigorous ones are really tend to be really technically demanding. And I just don't have the time to go through them given the constraints of this lecture. So I'm just, all I'm gonna do is sketch the basic ingredients that any derivation requires and state the generic conclusion of these derivations. So the setting is quantum field theory and curve space time. We're not in semi-classical gravity. We're not coupling the quantum field to the space time geometry. So we have a quantum field in the appropriate vacuum state that's treated as test matter. It doesn't contribute to curvature. It propagates freely against the classical space-time background. Nonetheless, it's still important to recognize that the quantum field and space-time geometry are not completely independent of each other because the conformal and the affine structures of the space-time geometry still guide the propagation and the Cauchy development of the quantum field. It's just like the geodesic principle in classical thermodynamics. When you treat a particle as test matter, you can still prove that it moves along a geodesic. That the space-time geometry still guides the behavior of the particle, even though the particle doesn't contribute. We don't think of the particle as contributing to the curvature. And the space-time geometry that we're gonna work with is a black hole. So an event, a, a, an event, a stationary, you know, asymptotically flat space-time with an event horizon. So the basic ingredients that one needs to derive Hawking radiation are, one has to make some topological assumptions. So for like a very common one is that the domain of outer communication is simply connected. The domain of outer communication is a space-time region outside the, between the event horizon and null infinity. So it's kind of everywhere outside the black hole is often called the domain of outer communication. One makes some causal assumptions, for instance, chronology, there are no closed, there are no closed timeline curves. One makes some stability assumptions, 
you know, small perturbations aren't going to destroy the event horizon. You make some assumptions about the asymptotic behavior and structure of stuff. So there's some, there's some instantaneous symmetries, like the VMS group at, at null infinity. There's some kind of almost conserved quantities. I say almost conserved because strictly speaking, there's not, you know, Hawking radiations, there's energy flux at, at null infinity, but we're kind of, but we're treating that as test matter, remember? So it, it doesn't contribute to the curvature. So, these, so there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of complicated idealizations and approximations that are, there's a lot of uh, moving parts here. And one kind of just has to, just to, stop worrying about it and kind of piously hope that it all it all hangs together and works out in the end and it seems to then there are some kind of arguments uh, uh, come assumptions about the singularity structure the the two-point correlation functions of the vacuum state for a given kind of quantum field near the event horizon roughly speaking we're assuming that the vacuum state kind of that its singularity structure looks like the singularity structure the correlation functions associated with the, with the minkowski vacuum state minkowski space time One makes then some arguments that you know, transforming the vacuum state to present it as it would appear to a static observer, an observer you know, following the orbits of the, of, the, of the stationary Keeling field. So an, an observer to whom the space time looks like it's not changing, the geometry looks constant, the black hole looks like it's not, not changing. When one transforms the vacuum state to present it um, to how it would appear to such an observer, that has a particular effect on the singularity structure and on the, on the correlation functions. Excuse me, Erica. Um, uh, Enzo has another question for you. Uh, yes. No. Uh, can Eric come back to the preceding uh, slide, please? Yes. Yes. Can you explain better the point two? I was not able to understand exactly what does mean is that there is a sort of. Uh, okay. So yeah, good. good, good. This is a, this is a very important point. So you know, there, there, there's a famous remark by John Wheeler that, you know, um, matter tells space-time how to curve, space-time tells matter how to move. So there, there's this you know, two-way street between matter and, and, and space-time geometry. They, they, they affect each other. They guide each other, they constrain each other. When one, uh, when one treats a certain kind of matter on a, on a, on, in space-time as test matter, one is assuming that the space on geometry is still telling that matter how to move, but one is assuming that the stress energy content of the matter is so small, it's negligible, it doesn't, that we can ignore its contribution to, to the, to the, to the space-time curvature. And so in, in this context, for instance, what, what that means for the quantum fields is <clears throat> we're going to demand things like um, in whatever way we can make sense of, say, energy propagation in the quantum field, it has to respect the causal structure of the space-time. We don't want energy. We don't want energy in the quantum field propagating faster than the speed of light. We don't want it propagating outside the null cones. So the quantum fields, the behavior of the quantum fields has to respect and be constrained by the space-time geometry, even though we're not including the stress energy of the quantum fields. In, in the Einstein field equation. Does that, does that help? Yes, yes, now understood. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. So, right, where, where it takes. So, um, we get this characteristic pattern of modes splitting the curse of the horizon, negative energy modes falling in, positive energy modes radiating away. There's the, the exponential schism between the motion of the, of the static observers and the, and the inertial observers, then automatically translate that, um, translate that into exponential scaling of the radiating modes. Um, and just magically that, be, that becomes, that exponential scaling, it takes exactly the form of a Planckian thermal spectrum. And so the conclusion is at infinity, late time, late time static slash inertial observers because remember, remember in, in the interior of space time, the static observers are accelerating and the inertial observers are freely falling. They're falling in geodesics. And at infinity, the two coincide. The static and the inertial observers are the same. So at late time, they, me they measure a flux of excited modes in the ambient quantum field with a Planckian thermal distribution encoding a temperature 
uh, surface you know, kappa over two pi, the Hawking temperature. I'm setting all the other constants equal to one. Hawking, so we have Hawking radiation. And it's important also to note though, that even though we attribute the, the, the radiation has the canonical Hawking temperature at infinity, the, radi the, the, the radiation in the interior space time is still thermalized. It still has, a to, a static, to a static observers, it still looks like it has this Planckian thermal distribution. It just has a higher, it just looks like it has a higher temperature. It's as you, um, it's red shifted. As you move towards the black hole, the temperature, the temperature that you, that the aesthetic observers think it has gets, gets higher and higher and higher. Um, before moving on, I just want to, I want to remark on one enormous conceptual problem with Hawking radiation, which is very weirdly is just all, never talked about by anyone. But Hawking radiation is not standard black body radiation. Uh, Rawad. Yeah, sorry again. Could you explain again what are these two observers? So one is outside the horizon moving inertially, and the second, the static one, is inside? No, no, the stat no, no um, uh, all observers are outside. And so when we, we have, um, in, in, the, in, the stationary, in the stationary black holes, the black holes, that look, they're, uh, that means that there's a time translation symmetry. So it looks like, in a sense, uh, the, uh, there's a sense in which the space time as you move forward in time doesn't change. It's, it's stationary. But of course, it doesn't look, it doesn't look like that to all observers. If, if, you're in, if you're in a certain state of motion, your state of motion may make it look like things are changing. The on, only observers whose motion respects this time, this time translation symmetry, and they're the so-called static observers, they're the ones who, it, to them, it looks like space-time really isn't changing. So, um, you know, it, um, it, it, it's exactly the same idea as in classical physics. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm running around wildly, accelerating wildly, then, you know, um, it, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking at a cloud of gas because of Galilean, because of Galilean rel relativity, <clears throat> I, I can just think, you know, well, I, I actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, 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 I'm at rest. And I just attribute all these weird forces to the gas. It looks like the gas is going crazy. Or if I'm, you know, just, just moving inertially, it looks like the, that the gas is in equilibrium, it's not changing. So how the gas looks kind of naively depends on my state of motion. Same thing here. So Hawking radiation is not standard black body radiation. But what I mean by that is it's not, gen in, this, in these derivations, it's not generated by, the micro by whatever micro degrees of freedom there may be of the event horizon. In standard black body radiation, you know, I, I, I have a lump of hot iron. It's, it's glowing, it's giving off electromagnetic radiation. That electromagnetic radiation is generated by the jiggling and wiggling of the atoms and electrons in the, in the, in the iron. And it's that kind of random chaotic jiggling and wiggling that gives rise to all the, um, all the different energy modes in the, in the electromagnetic radiation that gives rise to, in fact, the Planckian spectrum that, we, that is what we call thermal black body radiation. And that's exactly why it, for ordinary black body radiation, we think the temperature of the radiation is, is a direct proxy, is a direct measure of temperature of the iron. Because the wiggling and the jiggling of the atoms is, is what physically the temperature of the, of the iron is. And it's that wiggling and jiggling that created the electromagnetic radiation and that encodes the power spectrum, that, that yields the power spectrum. So there's this direct causal relationship between the thermal nature of, electro, of the black body radiation in this case and the physical temperature of the, of the, the statistical mechanical temperature of the iron. And that's why we think that, that black body, the, the temperature of black body radiation is the temperature of the iron. <clears throat> that is not what Hawking, that's not what's happened in this derivation. We have Hawking radiation is excited modes of an external quantum field that aren't even coupled to the space-time geometry. We treated the, 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 remember the quantum field is not coupled to space-time geometry in any way by the, by the Ensign field equation. So these, mo so there's no sense in which this derivation 
shows us that it's kind of the, the microdynamics of the event horizon that's causing or that's yielding or influencing or constraining what power spectrum we get in this thermal you know, uh, radiation of the quantum field that is the Hawking radiation. So it, to me, it's actually rather mysterious why we should take this as a proxy for the black hole's temperature but we do. I'll say a little bit more about this later on. And you know, perhaps most puzzling of all, is, you know, how did a theoretically predicted phenomenon, Hawking radiation, derived by, con by combining seemingly incompatible theories in a novel way, so as to extend their reach into regimes that we have no way of testing in the foreseeable future, constrained only by principles based on physical intuition, not owned in those regimes, become the most important touchstone for testing novel ideas in theoretical physics? Can it play that role? What epistemic warrant do we have or can we have for it in the end? I, I, I really don't know. So I have all, I'm running, I'm, God, I'm, this is all taking me so much longer than I thought it would. I'm almost out of time if I wanna leave time for questions. So how about if I go on for five or 10 more minutes and, and then I'll, and then I think I can, I can make it through basically the rest of these slides. And then we can stop the question. Okay, it's okay. Okay. Um, so Hawking radiation by itself, derived in QFT CST, does not lead to black hole radiation. One has to couple the Hawking radiation to the space, the quantum field, to the space-time geometry, by the semi-classical Einstein field equation, in order to conclude that the positive energy radiated away by the quantum field is being sourced by energy extracted from a black hole. That, that, that the black hole, the reason that positive energy is leaving is because it's being, it's being sucked out of the black hole. That's another way, again, another way to see why caulking radiation under standard der derivations isn't black body radiation. Because the derivation gives you no reason to think that the energy of the Hawking radiation is coming from the black hole because they're not physically coupled. So you, you, you have to assume the, the, the semi-classical Einstein field equation. There are no exact solutions of the semi-classical Einstein field equation known for a space-time representing an evaporating black hole. The approximate ones we have are severely limited in their scope and in their potential to yield general, general insight by dint of various kinds of almost absurdly idealizing assumptions and just the really deep and difficult mathematical problems like with consistency that we have in here. So um, I actually do want to take a few minutes to discuss the very complex and difficult methodological and epistemological situation we find ourselves in here. Because it turns out to be, from the point of view of a philosopher interested in the structure of our knowledge in physics, an extraordinarily rich situation that very problematic, that really deserves an investigation. So we're in a situation where we can't solve the equations. What do we generally do in physics when we can't solve equations? And there are either other mathematical difficulties that prohibit the use of, of standard approximative methods and numerical simulations, as, in, as here in standard classical gravity. Or it's the case that one doesn't want detailed information about individual models or individual possible, or individual possible students, uh, because, for example, the only ones we can derive are incredibly trivial, as in semi classical gravity. And again, narrow classical narrow classes of solutions, say, depending on these observed idealizations, just won't do the job anyway. So what can we do in physics when we're faced with this kind of situation? And especially, again, when it's difficult to experimentally access regimes in which one expects the behavior of interest to manifest itself as in sunny classical gravity. Well, one can try to prove or derive general results. And I'll tell you what I mean by general results in a minute. But what exactly is it that one is then doing? Well, there are two things. One can either try to prove a theorem. So you assume something of a suitably generic character, maybe an energy condition, and then you try to derive or argue for something of a suitably generic character. And the theorems that one can prove when one can't handle, when one really can't solve equations exactly, and one, but one is looking to try to learn something about the physical systems, they tend to be um, of the five following kinds. There are probably more kinds than this. These are the five that I, that I thought of, this is kind of off the top of my head. Uh, one can make non-existence claims. 
So there are no non-singular cosmological models satisfying you know, certain conditions. One can make rigidity stability claims about behavior. So this, these are topological notions. For instance, past singular closed cosmological models satisfying the strong energy condition are stable. Small perturbations don't destroy those properties. One can make scarcity generosity claim. These have to do like um, one, one imposes a measure on some class of solutions and one asks are, um, are the solutions that satisfy a certain property are they, how do they have a large measure? Are they zero in measure? So cosmological models with killing field are scarce. We think that under any reasonable measure, they'll, they'll be zero measure. One can make non-constructive existence claims. The classic singularity theorems don't construct the singularity. They don't tell you where the singularity is. They just say there must be a singularity. They just, so those proofs generally work by reductio ad absurdum. And one can make non-constructive behavioral claims, theorems that show that closed trap surfaces will generically form under gravitational collapse. The very beautiful deep uh, Shane uh, Sh Yao theorem, for instance, from 1989. That's one thing one can do when one can't solve equations. But often we find ourselves in a situation where not only can we not solve the equations exactly, but the mathematical situation is too difficult and you know, loose and ambiguous even to prove rigorous theorems. So what do you do then? And that's again, the situation we find ourselves in in semi-classical gravity. Well, I, the, what you do, I think in physics is you do something, is you try and produce something that is, I'm gonna call a schematic model. And this is a kind of model that's based on general principles. So you fix some general principles and some generic conditions, you characterize some general structures that embody the principles and conform to the, conform to the conditions. And then you derive a statement, non-rigorously, almost always heuristically, about generic features of the character and behavior of those general structures. You know, so you assume semi-classical gravity, you, you fix some quantum field satisfying the semi-classical, that you postulate satisfy the semi-classical lines in the field equation. And then you argue that black holes evaporate. So what exactly is it that one is doing with a schematic model over here? So these models often involve behavioral claims and it's, you know, black holes evaporate. They are, they are not individual solutions to equations of motion or field equations. Usually no exact individual solutions are known that represent anything like such systems, especially not in generality postulated. They do not otherwise represent individual solutions in any straightforward sense. Sometimes they are not grounded in exact rigorous theorems. They are not approximations to or idealizations of solutions because we don't know the solutions. And there are no clearly specifiable families of solutions that correspond to. I should emphasize that, that what I'm calling schematic models here that, that have these properties that behave in this ways that we use in these ways isn't limited to semi-classical gravity. I actually claim that these kinds of models, which I don't think have been studied in literature before, and again, so this is a, a very good philosophical problem for young philosophers to look at, what, what, these, what these kinds of models are and how they behave and what their epistemic properties are and so on. They appear all over physics. So the, we, 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 the, the exact same thing happens with Navier-Stokes you know, cl classical theory of viscous um, thermoconducting fluid. The, so the equations are just too hard to solve in any generality. We know very few exact solutions, almost always under conditions of, of assumptions of, 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 really, of, of really high symmetry. And so people make, so what is very, what physicists and fluid mechanics very often do are construct these kinds of what I'm calling schematic models. So the, th these models represent very general features that we expect certain often loosely characterized merely postulated families of solutions to have. Almost always one can loosely characterize such postulated families in several different, often mutually contradictory ways. So the kinds of, so we think that there exist solutions that correspond to the behavior captured by the schematic model, but it turns out that there are good reasons to think that there are many families of solutions, many different families of solutions that kind of each exemplify different aspects of the schematic model, and those families of solutions don't overlap. I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Thus, the, the schematic solutions have an interpretive looseness and a flexibility of consequence 
that is not characteristic of exact or approximative solutions. These are very different kinds of models than I think philosophers are used to thinking about. So let's return to black hole evaporation. And I'll very quickly show why I think that the idea of a schematic model is exactly what's happening here. So in addition to the assumptions used to derive Hawking radiation, we now also need the imposition of the semi-classical Einstein field equation. So we need behavioral assumptions about the coupling of the metric and the matter field. You know, the, 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 the evolution is almost stationary, whatever exactly that means. It's adiabatic, whatever exactly that means. A few other, a few other, a few other assumptions. And then based on these on really complex, largely heuristic, not rigorous arguments, based on very subtle assumptions that relate to the quasi-local behavior in the interior of the space time near the horizon, to global asymptotic behavior out near infinity, we derive black hole evaporation. So the, the, the claim is something like local negative energy fluxes at the horizon associated with the positive thermal Hawking flux leaving the horizon decrease the global ADM mass. So the ADM mass is the mass of the entire space time that's defined at infinity. It's a global, global asymptotic quantity. So, but somehow there's some mysterious relationship between this local negative energy flux, this global mass energy, such that infinite, it's defined infinitely far away, such that somehow this local negative energy flux decreases the global energy in such a way that kind of instantaneously the local area of the event horizon shrinks. The, the, rate, the black holes evaporate. And Hawking himself in 1975, I think, recognized exactly what, what kind of model he was constructing. He said it, it, should be emphasized, it, it, it should be emphasized that these pictures of the mechanism responsible for the thermal emission and area decrease are heuristic only and should not be taken too literally. It should not be thought unreasonable that a black hole, which is an excited state of the gravitational field, should decay quantum mechanically and that because of quantum fluctuation of the metric, energy should be able to tunnel out of the potential well of a black hole. So the interpretive looseness and flexibility of consequence as a general feature of the schematic models means that as the, this model, for instance, here, black hole evaporation doesn't pick out a unique behavior. It doesn't pick out a unique system. It doesn't pick out a unique kind of system. It's a very loosely character. It's, very loosely characterizes and very generic features and behaviors. And I can show that very, um, I, I can show you what I, what I mean in a, um, in, in, a, in a really striking, in a really striking way. So here is a picture, here's a picture of black hole, of Hawking radiation and black, and black hole, and black hole evaporation kind of focused in locally on, on the horizon. Here we have collapsing matter forming the event horizon. We have Hawking radiation you know, going away, taking energy from the, from the black hole. To, so the black, the black hole shrinks and eventually the event horizon disappears. That's a good picture of, of, black hole of, of the schematic model of black hole evaporation in the interior of space time. But now let's kind of zoom out and think about the global picture of black hole evaporation. Well, one way of doing that is represented by this global picture. Here, so we have the collapsing model, the formation of the event horizon. And, but now instead of a naked singularity forming when the event horizon completely evaporates, there's kind of um, in, implicitly represented in this picture, if you, re if you read the text and you read the surrounding, you know, uh, the description of the figure in, in this paper by, by, by Wald from 1984. There's a, there's a final burst of energy and all the information that was contained in the, in the black hole escapes in this final explosive burst. That's perfectly consistent. That global picture is perfectly consistent with the schematic model of black hole evaporation. But so is this picture. Here, so I, uh, so I, I should say here that there's no naked singularity. Whatever happens in this region is presumably governed by quantum gravity effects 
and we don't really we can't really say anything much about it. But whatever is the case, there's no naked singularity. The space time is really causally well behaved everywhere else. Here we have again the collapse to form the black hole. We have the formation of the event horizon, the singularity, the black hole shrinks and evaporates, Hawking radiation is going off to future infinity. And here, the, when the black hole evaporates, we do get a naked singularity. We get a singularity that is visible from future null infinity. Any observer up here can look back and see the singularity. This is a very different causal global structure, a global picture of the causal structure of an evaporating black hole spacetime. But it's completely consistent with the schematic model of black hole evaporation. So we have two mutually inconsistent pictures of how to fill out the schematic model both consistent with the idea of black hole evaporation. And it's exactly this interpretive looseness and flexibility of consequence of the schematic of black hole evaporation that lends the information loss paradox its really open-ended character and makes life even more difficult for us than it would have been. Because as I won't have time to talk about today, there are many different formulations of the information loss paradox, none of them clearly equivalent to each other. And there are many different proposals how to solve the paradox, each of which you know, some reasonable and some unreasonable people clearly see as a solution to it, and other reasonable and unreasonable people don't see as a solution to it. And I think a lot of this epistemic situation comes from the, I think, not widely recognized fact that black hole evaporation, that the picture we have of black hole evaporation is one of this very loosely characterized schematic model sense. So this is the last slide for today. This is the last slide of the talk. So before moving on, I do want to very briefly pause. <clears throat> I mentioned on Monday that I think that black hole thermodynamics um, requires us, not, it not only introduces new problems of its own, but it also requires us to go back and re-examine traditional philosophical problems and, and recognize that some traditional solutions to them, some traditional proposed solutions to them are inadequate. We can rule them out, at least in this context. And also thinking about the new situation that black hole thermodynamics presents us with might suggest new, new avenues of attack on these old traditional problems. So here's a tra one traditional problem. A traditional problem is uh, the ontology of space, time, and matter. You know, what is the nature of space, time, and matter? And the Hawking effect, I think, really proposes some really radical suggests some really radical changes to the traditional ways of thinking about it. And if you just think of quantum field theory alone, you know, the ontology of matter is that matter is these excitations and fields. Space-time is fixed. It's not affected by matter, so we can keep space-time. In general relativity alone, the kind of the ontology of matter is that it's associated with non-zero mass energy, with Ricci curvature. Space-time is dynamical, it's affected by matter. But it doesn't, it doesn't have, it seems like, any kind of localized energy on its own. It's associated with vial curvature. But when you introduce the Hawking effect, and it's, it seems like that there's this very clear distinction between matter and space-time in, in both theories. But when you introduce the Hawking effect, that very clear distinction, it looks like begins to evaporate. Because you have space-time curvature being transformed in the matter and its Hawking radiation. And you have matter being transformed into space-time curvature you know, uh, by, 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 by way of the shrinking of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the horizon area and the formation of the, of, the, of the central singularity. So I will stop there and promise that tomorrow we will really talk about the information loss paradox. There's just so much to say about all this stuff. I, 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 I'm sorry, I just, everything is taking a lot longer. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your clear uh, lecture. And uh, we have more or less uh, 15 minutes for the question. And so, uh, OK, Rava. I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll say one, one very quick thing about, about questions right now. Um, so I, I'm happy to go a little bit past 1 o'clock if other people are. That's fine with me. And also, I promise. If you put some questions on Slack, I will really um, answer them and discuss them if you don't have time to ask questions now. Well, I, I had some great discussions on Slack 
for the past two days. So please, I urge you, if you can't ask your questions right now, put them on Slack, we'll have a conversation there. Okay. Sorry, uh, before uh, uh, Rava, there is uh, Giovanni Sommazzi, sorry. So hi, Eric, do you hear me? I do, Giovanni, hello. Okay. So I wanted to go back to the issue you mentioned about interpreting space-time thermodynamically. So you said, how is it that uh, what in thermodynamics is an empirical fact in black hole physics become a mathematical theorem. And as you were talking, I thought that it seems as if mm, the idealizations GR rest on like space time is a continuous and so on, work not only for what they were built for, but they are able at least to some extent to host naturally possible empirical assertion of generalized thermodynamical kind. So what's your view on that? That's, no, you're, you're raising a really interesting, important point. Uh, I, I think it, it, it has to be the case <clears throat> that, however one, that however one tries to make sense of this situation, that what had been empirical generalizations are now the theorems of differential geometry. It has to, an explanation of that has to take account of the fact that one is making these very idealizing assumptions about the nature of, 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 of classical space-time. But I, I don't know, I, it's very difficult for me to say anything more detailed about it. I don't know how to make use of that fact in, in producing an explanation for the situation. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm really sorry to say that I don't think I, I don't think I have anything useful to say about this. I, I find it really deeply puzzling and confusing. I would love, I'm, I'm, I, I, I apologize. I really wish I could say something illuminating. I just, I, I can't. I see. But I, 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 will I will try to think about it some more and see if I can come up with something. But I thought about it for a long time and haven't come up with anything. So don't, don't, don't hold your breath. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's more about your conclusion if, um, on the philosophical issues. Um, just before if the slides, before you were talking about the um, schematic models. Uh, I was in so during the talk you referred to several thought experiments, the Gerock thought experiment uh, and the Bekenstein thought experiment. And if I'm not mistaken, it's that one of the most important arguments in favor of uh, black hole thermodynamics is Bekenstein thought experiments. So, so I, as you know, maybe there's a huge philosophical literature on this topic of scientific thought experiments. And I was just wondering what you thought about their importance, epistemic importance in black hole thermodynamics and what's the relation between what you're calling schematic models. Uh, yeah. That's a really great question. If you don't mind my saying so, it's kind of a schematic question itself. It's really big and wrong. <laughs> Um, let me see, let me let me see if let, let me see what I can say about it. So first of all, um, I, th I think that, there, that, that this is a really interesting situation. Like, again, I, mean, I, I keep I keep on saying this repeatedly. It's almost a mannerism. This is a really interesting situation. Well, it is. Everything's really interesting here. The if you look at Bekenstein's original arguments from 71, 70, 71, 72, 73, he published a series of papers in uh, in PRD arguing that black, black holes should be attributed to an entropy and that uh, we should generalize the second law. Every one of the time thought he was nuts. No one thought, took him seriously. And even in 1973, when Barding, Carter, and Hawking were the first to actually write down the four law, what we call the four laws of black hole mechanics and give proofs of them. Still, even in that paper, they explicitly say, but this is just a purely formal analogy. Clearly no one but a crazy person would think that black holes are really thermodynamical. They actually have a footnote more or less saying, there are some crazy people who think this, but you, know, you can ignore them. And clearly that, that footnote is directed to Bekenstein. And, and, it, and in retrospect, a lot of Bekenstein's argument, I mean, Bekenstein's arguments are really extraordinary in a lot of ways because they really are kind of convincing and compelling. But when you really look, kind of start pushing on them in detail, they really start to fall apart. They're actually, at bottom, they're actually really not very good arguments. But this happens a, a lot, I think, in the history of physics. There's a, there's a wonderful remark by the early, early 20th century mathematician Littlewood, 
where he said that a mathematician's reputation rests on the number of bad proofs he has given. The idea being that you know, pioneer work is hard. If you're the first person doing something, if you're the first person work, formulating a new idea and trying to prove things about it, you're gonna screw up, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna overlook things. Pioneer work is hard. Now, that, that's, the case with, that's the case I think with Beckenstein. When you look in, in retrospect, we can, we can be condescending and say, oh, Jakob, you silly person. That was really a terrible argument when you push on it. But actually, it was a, you know, he was a revolutionary. He was, he was doing something incredibly new. And the argument, so the thought, ex, and that's the character of a lot of these thought experiments, that when you really push on them and really try to make them precise and, 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 and rigorous, they fall apart. And yet they really seem to capture something, something of really deep physical importance about what's going on. And again, I, I think that that, that, this is, that that is a question really worthy of philosophical study. And, and uh, I, I know that people have, people have investigated related questions in the large philosophical literature on thought experiments. And I think that it would be, um, I don't know of any philosophical literature on this idea of schematic models because I just came up with this idea of schematic models a couple of weeks ago. So, but I'm not an expert on literature on models. Literature on models is, you know, infinite. And I'm not an expert at all. So maybe someone else has come up. I would actually love to know if any of you are know the literature better than I do. If you know of people who have talked about what I'm something like what I'm calling schematic models, please let me know. I would really like to read. I would really, really like to know what people think about it. But um, given that I won't even thinking about this stuff, not for a couple weeks, a couple of months. I suspect that there are very interesting relations between what I'm calling schematic models, given their interpretive looseness. And the fact that one can, when one tries to specify them, one can do it in a number of different ways that might be mutually inconsistent. And this character of thought experiments, this very common character of thought experiments, that they seem to tell us something that the good ones seem to tell us something very deep about the physics of the world. But when you really, when you really push on them and try to make them rigorous, they, they start to fall apart. So I, again, it's a, a, a very general answer, but uh, it's the best I can do right now. Yeah, okay, thanks. But you mentioned Slack before. I cannot find your channel and then I will leave the floor to... Uh, I cannot find where there's a discussion on Slack uh, that you were mentioning before. Have you, have you, ha have you joined the channel? You have to explicitly, um, you have to explicitly subscribe to channels. You want okay. to automatically. So um, the, the, there, are, there are channels called... Uh, Coffee break, reading material, Rubino, summer school, welcome yeah, production. But um, f f um, at the bottom of the list of channels, there's a, there's a little link, there's a little plus sign, add channels, click on that, and you'll see okay. a bunch of new channels to subscribe. Okay, to. okay, great, thanks. I'll, okay, good. Okay, I'll leave the floor, thanks. Enrico? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I had two questions actually, but uh, given the time, I think I will select just one and uh, uh, make the make you the other one on Slack. Uh, so it's actually about uh, um, these uh, uh, schematic models you talked about because they actually reminded me of uh, um, mechanistic sketch, sketches which are used by Macamer, Darder, and Craver in uh, a particular debate about a, a scientific explanation. Now they use them. Uh, for oh, I'm sorry, what were the what were the names you said? I missed. Uh, Macamer, Darden, and Craver. Uh, yes. Um, I think I can find the, the paper. Yeah, no, I, 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 know, I, I, know oh. the paper. I know the paper. I just... Okay, yeah. And they talk about mechanistic explanations. Now, I think they use them for biology or molecular biology. Mostly. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, my problem is, my doubt actually is, uh, um, you, might, you might object uh, if you use these schematic arguments, uh, schematic models in an explanation. So for example, to explain how you have uh, black hole evaporation starting from uh, um, Hawking radiation, um, someone might object that, that it's actually some kind of winner-takes-all conception, a winner-takes-all move. Mm -hmm. that, you, uh, that's my doubt. I don't know if you can comment, comment a little bit about it. Uh, can, uh, can you say a little bit more about what you mean, uh, uh, about what you mean by winner-take-all? Well, what I mean, is, you have... What, uh, what, what is the all that the winner is taking? Well, basically, you can derive, uh, you can explain um, not everything, but closely. So I want to have this thing 
I, I uh, elaborate, I construct my, argue, my uh, schematic model uh, quite loosely so that I can actually explain, derive that specific thing. Um, so it's somehow, well, not artificial, but uh, you know, it casts okay. some doubts actually. I see, I see what you're saying. So in, in, in American politics, there's, um, there, um, the, the, there's, there's an idea called gerrymandering where you, um, when politicians um, like divide up, divide up um, a state into regions, each one of which will get a political representative, the party in power always tries to draw the regions in these really weird, arbitrary, crazy ways to try to give themselves an electoral advantage. It's called, so it's called gerrymandering. You're kind of cheating in how you divide, this, in how you divide the, the space up so that you can take it, so that you can try and get an advantage for yourself. So yeah, I, I think you're, you're talking about a very similar idea here, uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility that these physicists are, are, are gerrymandering the situation, that they're, that they're kind of carving things up in a way that is prep, that it already privileges them that uh, what, what, what it is they want to accomplish, what they want to prove. It's kind of cheating. There, there might be some, che some kind of che cheating might be too strong, but this, the, the, there might not be completely principled reasons for why they're choosing to specify the schematic model in a particular way, but it's more guided by the fact that they want to derive a certain result. And so I think in fact, um, yeah, that, that, that does in fact happen in, the, um, in this context, in this, in this field. But most, you know, most physicists, I think, are, intellect, are intellectually scrupulous, intellectually honest people who really want to figure out what's going on. And so I think most often when that does happen, my guess, my guess is the physicists themselves aren't really aware of it. They aren't really aware of the biases that they're introducing. They're not doing it intentionally. But that doesn't mean it's that they're not there, that those, that those, that those issues aren't there. Um, so I, I think what th th this, is a, this really is a matter uh, where I think one can't, at least I find it very difficult to think of how one might introduce a kind of set of general, you know, regular, regular, regulative or methodological principles that if you follow them would ensure that you're not doing this kind of cheating. I don't see how to, I don't see how to construct such a set of, you know, re regular principles. It really is, I think, just a matter of kind of thoughtfulness and good, and good judgment. You just have to be really careful, really think about what you're doing, try to be very self-critical and try to make sure that you're not building into the situation from the start, the result that you want to get. Thank you, and then uh, I'll post the second, the second question on, on Slack, thank you. Eugene Chua, your question, please. Hi, uh, hi Eric. Uh, so um, just wanted to ask you, I think you mentioned earlier in the slides uh, something about how most people assume like almost stationary as a condition for uh, you know, uh, black hole physics. Uh, because firstly, it's like, you know, how ubiquitous is this is going to, I mean, head of video told me no one uses this assumption anymore. So I was wondering how... Eugene, Eugene, hold on a second. I'm sorry, but your, um, your, your audio is coming through not, not very well. Can you speak a little more slowly? Oh, all right. I'll speak a bit louder as well. Uh, yeah, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's yeah, good. Yeah, so, yeah. So I mentioned, um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, almost stationary as a condition or assumption that people typically make for uh, black hole space times. So, I mean, so I was wondering how, firstly, uh, how ubiquitous you think this sort of assumption is, uh, just as a factual thing from your own obs uh, observations, because, you know, uh, I had a, just like, I had a reviewer told me no one uses this argument anymore, so, so I just wanted to uh, hear a bit from you. And a uh, second more, I guess, conceptual question, I think, um, how do you think uh, this, uh, quasi, this quasi stationarity, right, as they call it sometimes, uh, relates to the problems with uh, quasi staticity and like classical mechanics, you know, the conceptual problems that, for example, John, uh, Northern has discussed for quite a bit. Yeah, thanks. Okay, hey, good. So um, the, the issue of, um, of almost stationary in the context of, of general relativity is yet another incredibly interesting problem that philosophers, uh, about, about the a general issue of a traditional problem. Philosophers think a lot about symmetries where um, general relativity, as is so often the case, introduces new wrinkles and new complexities and interesting new, new aspects to a traditional problem. It's in the context of Newtonian physics, in Newtonian space-time, there are real, there are very elegant and precise and rigorous ways to make sense of the idea of an approximate symmetry or something that's almost a symmetry. Because one has a fixed 
background space and structure with regard to which one can make objective um, principle, one can measure objective principle deviations from perfect symmetry. Like if you have a, a, a system that's almost spherical, you know, there might be a little tiny bump there. You can measure the, the deviations from perfect sphericity in classical physics by various ways, by, by, by various objective unambiguous ways. That doesn't happen in general relativity because since the space, there's no fixed background space time geometry to measure these deviations, the idea of an approximate symmetry is extremely ambiguous and diff very difficult to make precise. I know of a dozen different ways people try to make the idea precise. None of them really work fully. None of them capture everything one wants to capture. So I think that in a lot of special cases, one, that, that there's a kind of operational pragmatic way to make sense of the idea. And that's, that, that does happen here in, in, in this case of black hole thermodynamics. There's a kind of, in, in limited situations, there's a kind of pragmatic way of making sense of the idea of something being almost stationary uh, that is physically appropriate for this situation, but isn't generalizable. And um, so in one sense, so I, I think that one does in fact get issues that are very similar to the issues of, you know, of, of quasi-static, um, the idea of quasi-static in classical equilibrium thermodynamics that people like John Norton and Giovanni Valente have discussed. The, the same issues arise here because in, um, uh, under these ideas of almost stationary in, um, in black hole thermodynamics, it does seem like, you know, real physical processes will take an infinite amount of time. So you, you, do get that, you do get that kind of situation. But then um, the, the problems that, that, that John and, and Giovanni discuss in, in classical thermodynamics are made exponentially more difficult by the fact that it's, as I say, it's very difficult to make, even start to make sense of the idea of almost stationary. So I, I, hope, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. That was, that, that was helpful. And I guess I'll be talking a bit about that on my talk on Friday as well. Uh, awesome. I don't promise it's going to be good, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The last question of this morning, uh, Kirill. Yes, so my question relates to um, to the fact that for a local um, observer, the event horizon is locally not um, distinguishable, as, as, as you pointed out. And the transplanking problem that we've started discussing uh, yesterday as well how this might be cured by the firewall proposal. So my idea is as follows. So the event horizon is obviously localized for a distant observer who sits at infinity, right? Mm -hmm. And as we get closer to, to the, to the uh, goal or say whatever we think is localized, then this localization somehow is vanishing because as you say, for a local inertial observer, uh, it's not distinguishable. But then the transplankian problem arises when we get, get this exponentiation of modes exactly at, at where, where, where we have the, the horizon, at least that's the way I understand it from, from yesterday. So isn't this somewhat troublesome? So in, in that we can't really say where exactly the transplanting problem is supposed to arise, and if there's a, like if there's no way to go about it, um, what what is your like personal view of the firewall proposal, which I understand makes uh, a structure locally distinguished for even for an inertial um, observer? I, 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 yeah, I, I think that's a that's that's a really interesting question. I mean, to to me, the price of accepting firewalls is is too high. As, De as Dan intimated yesterday afternoon, um, if, you accept the fi if you accept firewalls, you basically accept that quantum field, the local quantum field theory, as we know and love it, and use it in CERN, radically fails under the most m seemingly mild of conditions. So remember uh, earlier I mentioned the example of, you know, con condensing the Milky Way a little bit and forming an event horizon around it when but at the event horizon, space, space time is essentially flat. 
because the, the, the black hole is so big. But according to the firewall hypothesis, even though you're basically in flat space time, quantum field theory just goes haywire, goes bonkers. So you, you have to really give up some very deeply entrenched, empirically well supported, dearly beloved physical principles in order to accept the firewall. Having said that, um, if the firewall is true, that does give you a way, as you point out, to, um, to localize the horizon for, you know, for, for, for all observers. And in, in a funny way, um, what that shows you, I think, what, what it suggests, and I, I think one can generalize this lesson because it, this, ha this, 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 this kind of phenomenon happens over and over again in this field when, when solutions are proposed. The firewall not only kind of screws up standard quantum field theory, it screws up standard general relativity. General, standard general relativity tells you nothing to distinguish about the horizon. The standard quantum field theory tells you you don't get you don't get massive um, you, you don't get ma ma massive energy singularities out of nothing. Firewall violates both of those, and it, vi and it violates them kind of together for the same reason. So a lot of solutions people propose to these problems depend on not just changing one of the two theories, but really making kind of complementary changes to both theories that kind of that fit together in, in really interesting ways. So I mean, there, there's a lot more to say about it, but I think I, I don't I don't want to keep people. We're we're we're, we're, ten, we're ten minutes late. We're ten minutes over. So I tell you what, um, uh, pl pl please write the question on Slack, and we can talk more about it there. Thanks again, uh, Professor Curiel. And uh, in the afternoon, there will be another student presentation at two thirty. And uh, um, enjoy your meal, uh, light meal, if possible. And uh, see you later. Thank you, Eric. See you soon. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much.